very early on identified the series of quotes that talk about before the foundation of the world or from the foundation of the world and that there was a series of three consistent things that come up when you look at those quotes about what was happening really before Genesis 1 verse 1 and those three things all revolve around the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom plan and you the saints. And so uh, that's, that's kind of like a, been a, a really important foundation to the way in which we approach Genesis, given that that was what the intention of God was as, as we arrive into Genesis 1 verse 1 and onwards. The second thing that we've been doing um, is we've been doing these things called prophetic design patterns or prophetic design principles, and uh, we've been rather uh, uh, super excited by, by, by that and, uh, of identifying ideas that commence in Genesis that essentially don't just repeat through the Bible. It's not like it's just like the repetition of a word that you see, uh, but you actually see an idea morph and take shape as you move through the Bible and often crescendos, even in Revelation, and it's often those ideas crescendo around the three ideas that uh, occur before the, before the foundation of the world. Crescendo in the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom, the saints, or often a combination of them. And the third thing we've been doing is those doxologies. We've been trying to get the kids to take these grand spiritual ideas that existed before the foundation that run all the way through uh, all the covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant, that run through to the future covenant in, under the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom and try and take those grand ideas and give a doxology of praise to God but then to personalise it, to make sure that they get, get within it. So we've been doing that um, at the class fairly consistently. Tonight we're going to do something just slightly different to that. This is something that's came from the class um, and we're going to, we've called it Early Atonement. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions tonight, so I'm expecting you to at least have a, have a try. So if I was asked to ask you to explain to me uh, the atonement, what are the key Bible passages that you would take, to, take me to for a full exposition of the atonement? Just start putting them out. When I say a full exposition, I think we're talking about a few different uh, elements to the atonement, of course the sin problem, the Jesus solution, and the future hope. So talk to me. What Bible passages would you take to someone, take someone to, if you wanted to explain the atonement to them? Romans 3, 5, and 7. Hebrews 2, 14. Hebrews 2, 14, yep. 2 Corinthians 5. Yep. Okay, I don't know what that is off the top of my head. Pop it down here. Thank you. Thank you. And you finish in... Yeah, that's right, yeah. So that's a cheat, that's a cheat answer. Um, <laughs> but let, let me... Let, I mean, these, I'm ticking these off as I go. So I have similar, similar uh, quotes. So if I was ever looking about the sin problem, Genesis 3, Jeremiah 17, Romans 7, Romans 3... The Jesus Solution, Romans 6, Galatians 3, Genesis 12, The Promises, Hebrews 2, I think someone said that uh, as well, Romans 8, uh, in terms, um, Ephesians 2, uh, 1 Peter 2, By His Stripes Were Healed, John 3, verse 16, famous quote, and in terms of the kingdom, many quotes, Matthew 24, Lord, Lord, uh, Matthew 5, The Meek Inherit the Earth, Well Done, Good and Faithful Servant, um, the visions in Revelation. So there's a stack of quotes that you would go to to perhaps pull together a thorough, complete, full understanding of the, of the atonement. And we would do that. We would take someone through over a number of nights, weeks perhaps, to give them a thorough understanding of the atonement through numerous passages. Um, and, and it would take a bit of time to, to move through that. Okay, so what are the atonement topics that would emerge out of all of those passages. And I'm probably after key phrases or key expressions, even key words. Let me help you. Blood. Go. Love. Love. Yep. Reconciliation. Yep. Covering. Covering. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
solution. Justice of God. Justice of God. Yep. God, man. Man's need to God, man. We got Christ in there. We talked about Christ. God's righteousness. God's righteousness. Yep. Do we deserve it? By God's grace, that's so unmerited. Yep. Okay, you want my list? I expected more from Riverwood, to be honest, but anyway. Okay, here's my list. And if anyone yelled out something that you think's not on the list, just let me know because I wouldn't mind jotting it down. God's requirements, sin, obviously that's implicit in the need for an atonement. Consequences of sin, sin prone, mortality, death, confession, faith, shedding of blood, <laughs> covering, don't think that was you, Dad, uh, forgiveness, unmerited, God's righteousness, someone defeats sin, identification, baptism, God so loved, uh, John, John 3, the Lord Jesus himself, uh, walk in faith, which is probably very similar to faith, a couple of lines up, hope beyond mortality, the kingdom of God, sacrifice. Did I miss, is there any that kind of solution? I like that one. It's probably one there. The way. The way. Yes, very good. Okay. Just the word love. Love. Yeah, how, did I, how is that not on there? Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So, with that little introduction, um, it's fair to say the atonement covers a wide variety of passages and a wide variety of topics, if you were to try and cover the, all the atonement. And tonight I'm going to put a bit of a thesis to you that a powerful explanation of the atonement is possible using just one chapter <coughs> of the Bible. And that, that, those are passages that we just spoke about and these, uh, these topics and their elements can be found in one chapter uh, alone, almost exclusively, almost all of those in one chapter alone. And probably only fairly recently that I've sort of appreciated the strength of this um, in this chapter, and it is... Bzz, thanks for playing. It's not. It's Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> but Romans chapter 5, I'm happy to... I might go and have a look at that just to see. Um, it's, uh, gonna, the thesis is it's from Genesis chapter 3. So maybe open that up because we're not going to go anywhere other than Genesis chapter 3 tonight. If we have a look at some other verses, I'll just read them to you. But we're going to stay there and we're going to note the incredible breadth of the atonement ty types, uh, t topics that are skillfully handled in this one chapter. And I think it's quite remarkable the number of elements of that previous slide that we'll, we'll see in, that, in this chapter. Of course, it's familiar to us. Um, but I think it's fair to say that in our, in my experience at least, our community sort of turns to this chapter for two primary reasons. The first is the one that may be written at the top of your Bible, if, you, if you've got a more uh, modern version. It, it, it's often written at Genesis chapter 3, two words, anyone got it there? What's the, what's the, what's the chapter titled? The, the Fall. That's right. So, um, uh, and I think 90% of Bibles that, that provide those little little inserts, call, call this, this chapter the fall. So we often go there for that. And then, of course, uh, as a community, we go there for the promise to Eve, the bruised heel and the crushed head. Uh, but they're, of course, part explanations of the atonement. Um, and, in fact, those two things, the fall and the promise to Eve, only really deal with sin's introduction to the world and the promise really of only just one single person overcoming sin. And so many of the atonement pieces are missing if that is all we were to take from Genesis chapter 3. There's therefore no method of you and I dealing with sin, uh, nor a methodology for salvation of the entire world, uh, no restoration from the problem of sin for, in particular Adam and Eve, falls out of, uh, out of say, Genesis 3 verse 15, uh, or for you, uh, only the promise, as I said a minute ago, of one individual, no hope beyond sin and mortality, no promise of the final eradication of sin and a restoration of the Garden of Eden. If that was all we were to focus on, being uh, the introduction, the fall and the promise to Eve. So uh, nothing earth shattering tonight, but rather I hope a healthy reminder of the full atonement picture that we can find in this chapter, which you are well versed in, to the point where perhaps you might even think about scratching out those two words at the top of your explanation in your, if you, that's in your Bible and thinking about giving it a different explanation other than the fall. So Mike is going to be our, um, our uh, orator tonight.
and uh, read verses as we go through it because we're just going to run through it together. And what I, what I want us to do is essentially build up this slide as we go through it. We've got the, the, um, the slide, sorry, this slide. We're just going to colour the words as we come across them as we go through Genesis 3. Well, not necessarily the words, the concept as we go through Genesis 3. So let's start with verses 1 to, two, 1 to 3, please, Micah. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had, God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're pretty familiar with the introduction of the serpent. The serpent and Eve converse and confirm what is the command of God, which is uh, to not eat of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So uh, just to build this up, I think this one's pretty clear, pretty obvious. And uh, perhaps as we go, I'll ask you to start thinking about some of the ideas implicit in the verses. But this one's pretty clear, right? The atonement's got to start with some boundaries. Here it is, uh, God's requirement of Adam and Eve. Okay, now let's read verses 4 to 6, please. Micah. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Thanks. Yep. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Thank you. Okay, so I just think it's helpful. Let's just do a quick reminder about... Uh, or, uh, yeah, reminder, treatise, whatever it is here on the, the elements of the first lie and the first sin. I think that's quite helpful. The first lie of course, in all of history, and it's the essence of the lie that is interesting. We, of course, know the lie is uh, if you break God's command, it will not have a fatal consequence. That's a lie. And you will, if you break God's command and do this, you will become like God. And so when we think about the subtext, what's going on in that lie, I think it's quite uh, self-evident what the sub subtext here is, that God himself is lying to you. So the lie is that God is a liar. And secondly, that somehow because it's almost as if God is, because he's, con he's trying to hold back Eve from becoming like God, then he wants to keep her in an inferior state. This kind of subtext, this idea that perhaps Eve could indeed be a challenge uh, to God himself. And so it's insidious because it traps Eve, not only because it traps Eve, but because of the way it challenges who God is. It's insidious in that, in that way. It, it, it challenges God's character and it presents him as uh, deceptive and quite weak-willed. So that's, a, that's a, uh, an insidious or uh, blatantly awful lie. So the first sin, um, verse 6 reads as though, and we just, if you can see it there in front of you, reads as though there's this progressive cumulative elements to the sin. She saw the tree was good for food, then plus then delight to the eyes, plus it makes one wise, then she took it, then she ate it, then she gave it to Adam, then Adam ate it. So I guess the question is, if there's all those elements to this first sin, which part is the sin? Is it all of it? Is it all of those elements, each one of those things in and of themselves are sinful? Is it the accumulation of all those elements? If you put all those elements together, that's the sin. So is it each step? Is it the cumulative total? What is it the crux of this sin? And of course, as a community, we often segue here from Genesis 3 over to 1 John 2 that refers to, you'll, you'll know it well, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I think that's Partly helpful, but partly unhelpful when we're trying to understand what is the element, what is, the, what is it at the crux of the sin. Because when you turn to uh, 1 John 2, John in his epistle is actually talking about, uh, uh, he's saying, don't love the world because he says that all that's in the world are these things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. So he's not, he's not sort of trying to undertake an exposition of what is the at the crux of the sin of Eve. He's explaining what is the consequences 
of, of what you've seen. The consequences that you've seen is that the world is driven by lust. That's the outcome. So what is the actual sin of Eve? And I think the fundamental nature or the key issue of, of or the crux of Eve's sin is actually best observed or best identified when we identify the opposite, when we see the opposite at, in action. And we see that, I think, best in Philippians chapter 2, another key atonement kind of passage. And that passage has a very, very clear Edenic uh, illusions within it. The language is very Edenic uh, in, uh, and, and, and references this moment, I think, of, uh, or, or parallels this moment of, that Eve, Eve is having with the serpent uh, by contrast to how Jesus deals with it. So you'll, you'll know it. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, so there's a Denic uh, echo right there, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So Paul is, and Paul's pretty emphatic about this, right? He's sort of, he, he's very clear on what is good about the Lord Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter 2. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he doesn't just leave it that. He sort of emphasises it. He says he emptied self. He, became, he took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself. He became obedient. He's like he's really pressing home this key element to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. There's an there's a Eden echo. So he emptied himself. He's humbled. He's a servant form. He's obedient to death. So those, those echoes, the Edenic languages... Is of course he's in the image of God, just like Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. There's this question of equality with God, the very thing that's going on with Eve in in this first lie, and of course this idea of this sort of visual clue about being grasped at, and he didn't, whereas Eve did. So Eve and Jesus are both in the image of God, but yet Paul puts his finger on what it is about Jesus's mind or Jesus's thinking that is distinct and leads to his exaltation revealing by contrast what Eve's issue is. So, of course, it's not, a, it's not each one of those things individually. Eve's not, it's not sinful that she saw the, good was, the food was good to, to look at, because, of course, all trees of the garden were good to look at. She was asked to do that, to look at how good the food was, but she lusted after the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because she thought it would make her wise. And so the subtext is pretty clear. When you think about the opposite, it is the opposite. She actually did seek equality with God. She did seek to grasp after something. She did not empty herself. She sought to elevate herself. She wasn't humble. She was proud. She wasn't a servant. She was self-willed. She wasn't obedient. She was disobedient. And uh, he, the Lord Jesus Christ did this to the point of death, whereas, of course, she sought to beat death. So I guess a nice little summary there is that of that scene is that Eve showed a usurping of God's authority and a worshipping and serving of self rather than God. All that leads us to only one extra part of our slide that we're trying to fill in tonight. We've identified not, not only the first lie, but of course the first sin. We're going to go and read a big slab now, and I want you, as we read it, to start seeing if you can see any atonement ideas uh, of that list that we that we've already looked at, see if you can see any of those as Micah reads us verses seven through to nineteen. All right, starting verse seven. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. 
and I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, if, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Thanks, Micah. Okay, well there it is in front of you. What, are you, what, what atonement ideas were in those verses? Help me fill that in. Consequences, right there, yep. Death, Death yep. What come, why does death arise? Because we are, what's the word before death? Mortal, that's right. And why does mortality arise? Because we are, what's the word before that? Two words before that. We are sin prone. We see some of that, that in there. Um, anything else? What's Genesis 3 verse 15 all about? Uh, no. Someone is going to defeat sin, right? That's what Genesis 3.15 is about. Someone is going to come along and crush the sin head, the serpent's head. Um, and I've got one other I thought I identified. Oh, this one's a bit weaker uh, because it's kind of a weak confession but I think there is a confession there's an acceptance that they've done the wrong thing there's a bit of a blame game going on but within that there is a confession there's an acceptance that they have done the wrong thing so I guess what I'm seeing out of verses 7 to 19 or from, from now 1 to 19 God set requirements sin has resulted there's been a consequence uh, uh, that has led to uh, sin proneness, mortality, death, there's a confession of sorts, but I think it's fair to say there's a confession. And the wonderful verse 15, which talks about someone defeating death and returning uh, to the dust and the like. Okay, so we're now 80% of the way through the chapter, and uh, we're still in pretty much a dire place in many ways. So some amazing things have been dealt with, but we're kind of in a dire place. Sin has entered the world. The impact of sin has been felt by individuals. Confession has followed. Consequences are spelt out to the serpent and to Adam and Eve. The consequences of mortality become uh, ubiquitous. Uh, life was to be difficult from this point on in having children, working, and even in the nature of the relationship between the man and the woman. There's one positive element that someone from Eve would arise who would triumph over sin. But half, 80% of the way through this chapter, there's still no clear hope for Adam and Eve. There's no promise of a change to their status. There's no promise of Eden restored. There's no forgiveness for Adam and Eve as yet. There's no grace for Adam and Eve as yet, as far as I can see, and there's no mercy for Adam and Eve's Eve as yet. And so there's critical elements of the atonement well and truly still missing and it's pretty personal because there's no forgiveness here available to Adam and Eve nor their descendants. So that's, that's us. And so we come to what I think is probably the key verse of Genesis chapter 3. And it's key for Adam and Eve and indeed for you and I. And uh, it's a pretty strange verse, to be honest. It's a verse that you would could pretty quickly and comfortably skip over, given its content. So just think about this. In the, in the middle of this narrative, in the middle of this story of idyllic Eden coming completely unglued, the story that of now sin, of consequence, of mortality, curses, this apparent, there's this apparent, in verse 20, out of sequence, almost out of the blue, it's almost an interjection into the narrative that Adam says, oh, and, um, and I call my wife's name 
Eve. And this is the verse here. And Adam called the name of his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Um, and I think it's a pretty odd interjection, perhaps better located somewhere else in the chapter. Um, and as many of you will know, the name Eve is taken from a word or an idea that has already been established in the preceding chapters in Eve, in, in Genesis rather. To, and so to understand what this name is all about, you need to understand, um, is to understand the reason for this verse kind of being in here a little bit sort of out, of out of sequence in the narrative. So let's just have a bit of a look at the name Eve. Eve is the word chava, uh, life giver. Comes from the word chai, which, you know, l'chayim, to, to, to life, life. And uh, if you look at, uh, so here's, here's all the occasions of the word uh, in Genesis 1, 2 and 3. So it's a pretty, fairly prolific word, this word chai, uh, uh, or life. And uh, it's been used up 13 times in the preceding verses. And so it's things like in Genesis 1, verse 21, God creates chai, living creatures. In, verses, in chapter 2, verse 7, God gives chai, he gives life. In 2, verse 9, God causes to spring up from the ground the tree of chai, the tree of life. And so once again, you might remember last week we spoke about a word that God owned, the word create. Again, here, early on, this is another God-owned word. It's a, it, only God gives chai. That's his unique power. He gives life. So let's think about this. Let's think about what Adam is saying. Argu arguably, Adam deciding to name his wife life giver is complete error. He's adopting a word that is completely ill-fitting the circumstances. So is it arrogance? Is it delusion? Is it a sin of usurping God's authority? Humanity has just been punished with mortality and Adam takes it upon himself to call Eve life giver. I mean, is he just a, is he is he a stand up comedian? Is he ironic? What what is it when he says I'm going to decide in the face of death and mortality and sin, I'm going to call Eve life giver? Well, I think you know what the statement is. This is his, of course, statement of faith. This is a statement of faith and belief in the promise that God has just given. Adam has faith and he's completely signed on to the promise of someone coming from Eve, the seed of the woman, who would come and crush the head of the serpent. Faith that the only hope of undoing the consequences of sin is from the person who comes from Eve, the head crusher. And so here we have a statement more or less of the faith of Adam in the promise of God. So it's not a statement of arrogance, it's one of faith that he was fully committed to this idea that's set out in Genesis 3, verse 15. And if someone has faith, what is their status before God? It's a question. If you have faith, what is your status before God? Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. For a person, Romans 4, for a person who believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And so I think there's a couple of other atonement things to note when it comes to just that one verse alone, which at first glance seems a bit out of sequence. It's an important verse. Uh, we have these ideas of faith, walking in faith, perhaps that yet is yet to be demonstrated, but this idea of faith uh, emerges. So he declares his belief and demonstrates his faith. And I'll just remind you that Paul sets out three steps in Romans chapter 4. Step one, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith. So if you believe, that's faith, that's step one. Step two, is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts, righteousness apart from works. 
you believe, you have faith. Step two, that's counted as righteousness. Step three, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So how do we know that's true? How do we know that here is this kind of, kind of turning point verse that says God, that Adam has faith in God, that God counts it as righteousness and that that righteousness will lead to the forgiveness of sins. How do we know that? Because of the very next verse. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Just as Paul says, belief, faith, righteousness, Adam and Eve are then forgiven and clothed. Um, and I think this is... Uh, is a beautiful insight into the character of our father once again. Like this is like, this is very early on in his plan from before the foundation of the world. And look how he acts when it goes awry. This is the God who creates, who gives, who commands, who dictates the consequences for sin. How's he going to respond to these sinners? Uh, will will their contrition for sin, will their even their shallow, limited expression of faith by just naming Eve, uh, Eve, will that have any bearing upon God, will he be exacting rather than forgiving? Well, here he is. He's generously responsive. And I don't know how you read it. It's like it's, it's, like it's immediate. But he calls him Eve. And the next thing, verse 21, uh, the Lord God makes, uh, makes a covering. It's instant. It's immediate. He's active. He's involved. And he makes this covering. It's all, it almost seems hasty. Um, and I don't mean that in a careless way. It's like he's quick to respond. So what are the atonement things to note out of that? We've got a few others. We've got um, forgiveness. Uh, we've got unmerited. Surely they didn't deserve this. I'm just calling Eve, faith, uh, Eve, Eve Eve and then having faith in God that doesn't mean that, that God should, should necessarily uh, forgive them and cover them. You've got a covering. You've got uh, shedding of blood. We can see the righteousness of God in this. Um, you've got uh, identification. You've got that idea that God so loved the world. You've got animal sacrifice. Um, and uh, this idea that Adam and Eve naturally would have connected their sin to the death of this, this animal. The animal represents what should have happened to them and sin has resulted in an immediate death to an animal. So I think if we get got a fair bit more happening there in terms of the atonement story that falls out of Genesis 3 verses 20 and 21. Um, and what's probably really important is it starts to explain how the atonement works for people like Adam and Eve and you. It contains the selfish answer to the woe of the sin entering the world. Because Adam and Eve are not necessarily saved by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ crushing the serpent. It's a promise of the, of the defeat of sin, which has just been thrust upon the earth. But the methodology of salvation isn't necessarily articulated in Genesis 3, verse 15, verses 20 and 21 provide an additional colour to the answer, a fuller answer. Belief, faith, declared righteousness, covered and restored by the death of an animal, presumably a lamb. You heard Zaz talk about that a couple of weeks ago. When you, when you think about the consistency of the pattern, it has to be a lamb by a God who demonstrates mercy and love upon undeserving people. Okay. Yet, despite forgiveness and despite a covering, the, the fundamental disconnect between the sinner and the pa paradise remains. Sin is not removed completely. Adam and Eve remain burdened by it. And so, of course, access to the tree of life must be suspended. Like, they can't stay. There, there's, a, there's a dissonance between them and the place, them and the tree of life, them and paradise. There's a, it prevents them from staying. And so we land at another, in a sense, pitiful point in the chapter. 
despite confession, despite the consequence, despite faith, despite righteousness, despite being covered, despite being forgiven, they still remain trapped by sin and must be banished from paradise. And if it wasn't for the next verse, uh, sorry, do you want to read verses 22 to 23, Micah? Thanks. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. Thank you. Covered, forgiven, but still a dissonance. Can't, can't stay in the garden. If it wasn't for verse 24, then it would be a dire ending for them and for us. And verse 24, uh, I think, is, is a remarkable verse because hope is not lost. Hope is actually provided in the closing words of the chapter. The closing words are... He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And the hope lays in the dual role of the cherubim, the sword and the flame. Of course there is a role there of the cherubim, the sword and the flame to ensure that that tree is not polluted by Adam and Eve gaining access back to it. But there's a stronger or equally as strong idea. Of course, of course, that's one of the roles. It's to guard, to stop them from getting back to the tree. But there's two other really interesting ideas here. And that is, of course, the way, which was um, Tim's, Tim's comment, the way to the tree is preserved. Despite all the tragedy that's unfolded in this chapter, despite the squandering of paradise, God, God doesn't rub out the pathway. The way is preserved and the cherubim have a pretty specific role when it comes to the way. The cherubim are to guard the way to the tree of life and we've seen that word used already in earlier chapters. It's a word that Adam was asked uh, to, uh, abide, uh, to obey. His role was to keep the garden. That's not to prevent, that's not to stop. That's not to, his, his role was to tend and to keep, to look after the Garden of Eden. That's the idea here. So the Caribbean wasn't, weren't just there as God's henchmen or God's bouncers to the Tree of Life. It had, a, it had another role. They were also, their role is also they are to guard, to keep, to tend, to ensure that pathway remains in place back to the Tree of Life. And so I think in, the, in this verse there's a statement of intent in, 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 uh, in verse 24. There's a statement of surety. The tree of life will, um, will factor somehow into the future. I mean, the way is being kept to it. The garden remains. God doesn't rub it out. He actually preserves it, keeps it. So there's a statement of intent. This pathway to this tree of life is being protected and kept and existent. And so there's an exciting idea there to sort of grab hold of uh, at the close of this event. Though thrust from the garden, hope and the promise of a return is provided in a God who makes sure the pathway is kept for no, no doubt some future reason. And so the atonement thing to note is um, Hope beyond mortality. We talked about this. The kingdom of God. Hope beyond mortality, and the kingdom of God. I think is implicit there in the closing verses of uh, the closing verse of Genesis chapter three. And so we arrive at the end of the chapter, and we test the thesis. This, uh, does this chapter contain the majority of elements of the atonement? And I think you get this kind of very clear progression of ideas, introduction of sin. There's this promise of a triumph over it to the point of killing it, and yet there's this, this well, I think 